Every single overnight success, everybody that's been labeled as an overnight success, didn't sleep at night, sweated, you know, bled, there was tears, there was heartbreak, there was betrayal. All of that stuff along the way is all dismissed and ignored and invisible because all they see is Lambo, private jets, beaches, Dubai, girls, bottle service. That's what they see. And they don't realize that everything that led up to that is usually a decade of sacrifice and hard work. Every day that you get up, you make choices. And each one of those choices compound on top of the other choices, which deliver you certain results. I can always tell what somebody's choices look like in their day by looking at their results. Women will only share a high value alpha. In fact, women are more apt to share a high value alpha than be straddled with a faithful loser. It's why women would rather date a rich, successful doctor that's married than a broke loser that lives in his mom's basement with a neck beard, smoking dubs all day, playing video games for a career. Richard, let's kick off. I want to start in the era of masculinity. Do you think masculinity is, is declining at the moment? It's absolutely declining. There are weaker, softer men. There are more weaker and softer men out there today than in any other time in history. It's very clear. I mean, you know, you look at the month of June, which is just wrapping up now, Pride Month, and what that's become. It went from a day to a week to a month, and it seems like they keep pushing into that. Uh, conventionally strong, masculine, virtuous men aren't admired and celebrated as they used to be. You go back to the old action heroes, right? We had Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jean Claude Van Damme, Rambo, Sylvester Stallone. Now, who do we have? Ants, bugs, spiders and spandex costumes looking kind of funky, right? <laughs> so yeah, I do believe that, that masculinity is certainly on the decline and I think it's orchestrated. What do you think the catalyst has that been? Because this is, it happens slowly and then it happens all at once, like every mm -hmm. tragedy in the world. So like, you know, you're a little bit older than me, I'm 27. What has been that snowball effect from your perspective? I don't know that there's any one thing I could say that was like the catalyst, the pivot, you know, the turning point, but there's, but there's been a general progression to softening and pussifying the Western male. Um, every show that I watched as a kid growing up progressively got worse and worse. So if you take Hollywood and sitcoms, you know, for example, um, they progressively got worse and worse, showcasing the man, the husband, the father as a bumbling idiot who was the butt of all jokes. And the mom was always a strong, virtuous uh, one that would correct all of his bumbling, idiotic mistakes, and they would make a big joke out of it. And I think uh, that to me was one of the most obvious things when I sort of unplugged from the matrix, as they call it, sort of thing, and dove down the rabbit hole and took the red pill and all that. Um, that became very, it was like a frying pan to the forehead. Like you just see it, you, you know, you see it everywhere. You see it in ad advertisements and commercials. Um, it's, it's everywhere. And then when you start looking at beyond Hollywood, how the government treats you, how, how the school system treats you, like even school systems today, my man, you know, you look at uh, the conventional Catholic school boards, even here in Canada, um, you know, people have asked me about religion many times and the, the original rule book, if you're going to subscribe to a religion is the religion. Now we have these new bastardized versions of it where it's like, well, Let's include rainbows and let's include pronouns and let's include wokeness and in conventional religions that didn't include that for thousands and thousands of years. So they carve out these new exceptions to lean into areas that I believe soften and weaken the Western male. And a softer, weaker male is a more agreeable male. You know, they're easier to control, they're easier to manipulate. The next time you want to lock down people, there's going to be fewer people out there saying, wait, hang on a second. Are we sure about this? Is this something that we really need? Is this absolutely necessary? Why are they doing this? You know, questions. You made, a, you made a good point there about, you know, tapping into the younger generation because that's where you infiltrate someone's mind to some degree and you, that's you, how give, them the most, you give them the most direction or you can, you can influence them easily, you know? And I know, you have a, and I know you have a daughter as well, so that's obviously something that's very personal to you. Correct. Um, how, like, how, how are you kind of approaching that even from like a father perspective? Because like, there's some things you can obviously control. And I know you talk about this a lot as well, how like there's some things you just can't control. It's just, yeah. it's just fucking happening. Like the earth is collapsing yeah. to some degree. So like, how do you approach that? Cause my brother, for instance, has a young daughter. I don't have any children, but I actually feel 
like kind of burdened by that because that kind of seems like a, that's a slippery slope because it's yeah. like you're you've no control of what's happening to the education of your daughter in particular yeah i think as a father you have an obligation to set the record straight with your children and not let so the school system or the state interfere in their upbringing, which the school system, the state constantly try to do. You'll hear leaders today talk often about how they have rights to your kids, which previously they never enjoyed, right? They have rights to teaching them certain concepts and ideas uh, that previously they never had the opportunity to talk to your kids about because they were prohibited. Because that was if the parents wanted to introduce these certain ideas into their children's lives and they would be the ones that would contemplate that. And in fact, if you go back 100 or 200 years, if parents did the kind of things that the state's doing right now, the state would have intervened and smacked the parents around. In terms of like uh, the children education, like you're literally approaching yeah. kids who are most vulnerable in some aspects that are easily influenced. And in that regard, like how do you approach it as a, as a father? Because of course, yeah. like you can homeschool children, but that's a, that's a complete different, you know, kettle of fish to open up in that regard as someone who's busy as you are, you know? Yeah, it's difficult, you know, because children don't really listen to their parents anyway. Like I remember by the time I hit 12, 13, like around the time you hit puberty, you know, you start listening less to your parents and you think they're a bunch of Muppets and you kind of like look mm -hmm. the other way and you listen to your friends. And for me, I think the outside influences when I was a kid were more or less music. And for me, it was heavy metal, um, skateboard magazines, um, bodybuilding type of magazines. It was it was basically music and magazines, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there was no wokeness infused it. You didn't see any rainbows. You didn't see any of that nonsense that you see today. There's no use of pronouns, made up stuff, extra genders that never existed before. Um, today, I think with the advent of screens, had handheld devices, iPads and phones and, and things like that, um, kids are constantly bombarded with these messages and parents give phones to their children way too, way too early, in my opinion. There's six, seven year olds out there that I see, you know, they'll go out to a restaurant, you know, as a family and you see the family sit down at the table and the kids immediately are sitting there looking at screens with headphones on and the parents just let 100%. them do it. Right? 100%. Like, you know, they let the screens educate and raise their children. And I mm -hmm. think, you know, as a father, you've got an obligation to demonstrate to your kids what a strong, you know, like if you're a man, obviously, what a strong, virtuous, alpha, masculine man looks like, behaves like, how they make choices in life, uh, things that they're going to sneer at, you know, for example, that they disapprove of. I think that you can set a pretty strong and clear example for your kids from that regard. And that's the best that you can do, you know, mm -hmm. um, because they are out there in the world. You know, they're out there with their friends they are out there doing social stuff. They've got extracurriculars. They're obviously going to be involved in the school system if you're not homeschooling them. So you basically do the best that you can do. And, you know, you, you have to surrender to the existence that you live within, you know, I suppose, if you're not going to move. You know, mm -hmm. um, there's people that have decided, well, this isn't for me. I don't want to have it. I don't like the way the school, the government happens to be. So they'll homeschool. They might move to another country that they see as a better place to raise children, better opportunities. Uh, you know, things change. Like I was born in the UK and my family decided in the 70s that it would be better for them to live in Canada than it would be to live in England. Um, I think I think that's changed now. I don't know that Canada yeah. is the best place in the world to live and raise a family. It's certainly a difficult place to live because the tax system sucks. Uh, you pay more than 50% uh, on your income taxes when you're in a top income bracket. The winters suck. Um, you know, they want to infuse wokeness into everything now. There's rainbows everywhere and inclusivity, even in the um, you know school boards that didn't typically traditionally subscribe to those notions. Mm -hmm. So I think that times change. And I think that, you know, if you have the capacity to maneuver, if you have the ability to move, then if you have the ability to do that, then do that. If you want to homeschool, then do that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm in an environment where I'm divorced. So, you know, we have a shared parenting plan and we share custody of our, our kid. Um, so I don't see me convincing my ex-wife to move her side of the family to somewhere else in the world. Cause I think it's a good idea sort of thing. So there are limitations to your ability to maneuver, but it's certainly something thing, you know, something that you want to contemplate if you want to raise a family, if you're a younger man is, okay, well, if I want to have kids and want to pass on my name and pass on my seed, do I want to do it here where I'm living? Are there better places for me to do it? Are there tax advantages to relocating? Do I like weather better somewhere else in the world that might be more interesting to me? There's lots of questions that you should uh, you know, be asking yourself. And I don't think the world's as big as it used to be. Uh, yeah. Air travel is cheaper. Most people now can almost always work remotely, or if they don't want to work remotely, they can create a business for themselves that is location independent and they can run it from anywhere in the world. So you're not beholden to 
you know, some some crazy leader of a uh, country that you don't agree with their metrics or, or their ideas. Um, so there is, I mean, there's pros and cons to all of this, right? Yeah, you, of course. You know, you lose some control, but you also gain some control when you see things for what they really are. And that's why I really like admire your work because you don't like say it as this one overarching statement like oh get up and move get out of Canada fifty percent mm-hmm. now you know you're like you're like realistic about it and of course you've actually lived many different lives in some regard because over the last couple of years you know your life has changed in so many different ways mm-hmm. but what's really cool is the fact that I think you were one of like the OGs that have like unplugged like before like the Matrix was cool you had actually like escaped the Matrix like, I don't know when the unplugged Alpha was written but the philosophy I started writing sharing. it in 2017. Oh man, like I was a fucking yeah. kid in 2017. I was I was still in school yeah. back in 2017, you know? Yeah. That was before even any of it became like a trend like it is now. But yeah, and this is just what, the start of things too. Like we're just beginning exactly, here. Exactly, but I think you need to have those influences like yourself, Justin, as you're speaking, people like even like Andrew, who are like positive influences on younger people because there is there's a lack of male role models that people like myself, who are like young entrepreneurs who are trying to work really fucking hard, can look at and kind of say, okay, this is someone that I want to mirror and move towards. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that in terms of like, do you think there's people that are at your level that are good influences for young people like myself, who's maybe 20 years younger than you? Yeah, I think there are some strong influences out there, but it also seems that the stronger and more vocal you are, the harder they try to silence you or remove your opportunity to influence the youth because they want to influence the youth. I mean, it seems that it seems that way with what they've done with Andrew Tate anyway, right? Like he's not perfect. He's obviously got a bit of a peppered past, but I think he has a positive influence on young men and what he's saying. I mean, I don't disagree with it. Like, you know, be strong, learn how to make money, be competent, know how to fight, uh, lead a woman, you know, be able to defend a woman. Um, you know, like these are just basic ideas that were common 70, 80 years ago in my grandparents' age, right? When they were growing up yeah. today, it's, um, it's almost bizarre to hear it. You know, it's, it's, it's considered fringe in some cases. Mm-hmm. What was the trigger for you to quote unquote unplug? For me, it was a sequence of events. So I would pin it down to three different, mm-hmm. uh, things that happened in my life. So in, the late 2008, I think 2008, nine, uh, just after the financial crisis, the Canadian dollar was on par and we saw, so to start, to sort of rewind a little bit, I was running a debt negotiation business since 2003 here in Canada. It grew very fast. We got awards for hyper growth. We got awards for company culture. Um, we were doing very well for quite a while. And then the financial crisis hit in 2008, 2009. Um, the Canadian dollar was on par with the U S dollar. There was legislation in the U S for the debt settlement industry that made it, uh, more interesting for American companies to advertise in Canada, which they did. And they essentially lied. Most of them, um, misled customers and over-promised and under-delivered, which caused a lot of problems. Uh, regulators got involved and then they started to change the legislation. They started working on changing the le- legislation, not for the purpose of protecting the consumer, but for the purpose of protecting the profit margins of the banks. There was some nefarious action that some of the U S players were using. Um, but I don't think it was the end all be all. It was, it was very simplified and they could have fixed it by changing very basic parts of the legislation. But instead what they did was they took consults from the banks and the credit card companies and they essentially changed the laws to make settling debt uh, next to impossible. And for me, that was a big red pilling moment because I thought the entire time in my life, well, the government would would do the right thing in a scenario like that and protect you know, the constituents, protect the voters, protect the consumers. But what they did was they changed the legislation to protect the profit margins for the banks and credit card companies. So that was interesting. And that was, that was a big red pilling moment for me. The second thing that happened after that was... Um, I discovered that I essentially married the wrong person. So we'll just call it that we weren't on the same page and I needed to untie the knot. And I was under the impression, okay, well in Canada, you get married, you know, you take your vows and all that sort of stuff in front of family, in front of the church. Uh, and if it doesn't work out, there's always divorce. So I figured it would be a simple, a simplified and easy process. But what I discovered, it's not, 
uh, everything in the legislation that's written in family law throughout most of the Western countries. So not just Canada, but many states in the US and the UK and Australia and stuff like that. Um, they're mostly written to enrich and protect women, which would have made sense 30, 40 years ago when deadbeat dads were not you know, taking care of their kids. But they changed the laws in, in such a way that you're basically treated as an ATM if you're a man. They extract resources from you. Uh, they uh, criminalize you, you know, in the sense where fathers are not appreciated. Uh, they're disparaged. They're looked down upon. They're not respected the same way that moms are. And they essentially move his resources to her. And they do it in such a way that allows her to control the untying of the knot, which generally means control comes with, with uh, authority and power over the family and over the uh, kids, which they generally give to women eight out of 10 times still. And he's often left in a position where he's bankrupt, destitute, broke, living in his parents' basement, watching his wealth transfer over to his ex while she alienates him from his own kids. Now, I didn't personally have that experience. I didn't have a great experience, but my experience was such that I started to read case law between couples getting divorced when I was going through my own divorce because I had to square away in my head what I was up against because I'm very, I'm a very strategic player in life. Like I played chess when I was a kid for, for, for years. So, um, I approach a lot of things in life from a strategic perspective. So I wanted to learn as much as I could about divorce, which I did. And again, that was my second red, red pilling moment. Cause I thought, well, I thought it would have been easy, but it's not, it's very difficult. Mm. And most men get wrecked at the end of it. And it's not great for kids either. I mean, the real losers in this, um, some would argue are the fathers, but I think the real losers end up being the kids because they end up getting, they don't understand the effect that, that being raised by a single mom has until they become adults. And they realize that most single mother households are essentially beta factories. Like that's one of the things that softens and weakens males is 43% of children today are being raised in single parent households, which is either by choice because, you know, moms just get um, pregnant and they get knocked up by a loser and he runs off or, you know, they end up getting, you know, uh, divorced and they end up taking, uh, you know, the resources from the father, but either way it's, it's either by no choice or by choice, you know, choice around, but they, but they still are in control of raising the kids 80% of the time and they don't do a very good job of it. The vast majority of teenage pregnancies, crappy marks in school, runaways, gang activity, suicide attempts, um, you know, you can go right down the list. Um, mm -hmm. the vast majority of the incarcerated today in jails come from a single parent household, you know, from a single mom. So they don't do a very good job at it. So that's, so that's part of the beta factory, um, you know, issue that comes up with softening males. So the whole divorce process for me was a big red pilling moment. Um, so that was number two. The third one was after I got divorced. Um, so I was married for a few years. I was, uh, you know, engaged and, uh, and dating my ex-wife, you know, for quite a while. Um, and then I went back into the dating pool, I don't know, 2013 or so, I guess. Um, and that's where I started mostly dating women around my age or a little bit younger. So I think I was 38, 39 at the time. And I got involved, like I was dating a bunch of women, having a good time. You know, you're talking to them and a lot of them were, you know, for the most, most part train wrecks. They weren't in very good shape. They weren't very yeah. attractive. I've always taken very good care of myself as far as what I eat and exercise. So I came across this one gal who was very fit. Um, she had the typical post-divorce breast augmentation, you know, so she looked hot. Um, mm -hmm. a lot of people would, would have commented at the time when I was dating her, like she looks like Jennifer Aniston. So she was that caliber of attractiveness, right? So if you're a fan of friends, you know what I'm talking about, but I dealt with her for about three years and she had two kids in tow from her own, uh, separation slash divorce. And I invested into a relationship with her and kids that weren't mine. And these ego investments never paid off. You know, I got a lot of pushback, uh, a lot of disrespect. I discovered that you have responsibility as a parent to somebody mm -hmm. else's kid, but you don't have any authority. And as a father, you know, you generally have responsibility to your own kid with authority. Now, the authority part's been stripped, is slowly been stripped away, but the but the deal that you get when you sign up for a single mom sucks because you end up essentially cuckolding yourself, which if you don't know what that means, you're 
essentially choosing to raise another man's seed when you get involved with a single mom, because they're generally not looking for love. They're looking for help. Right? Yeah. You know, there's this notion that they're looking for love and that they want a, another stab at it. They want another, you know, go at love. Maybe the grass is greener somewhere else. Maybe they'll find a better man sort of thing. And that might be the initial push for it, but, but they're really not looking for love. They're generally looking for help in life. So I did that ego investment, spent three years with them, traveled, paid for, you know, paid for certain things, you know, here and there. And at the end of it, I ended up getting, you know, betrayed. Um, she ended up cheating on me a couple of times. And um, the, the, the whole notion of putting time, effort and resources into somebody else and their kids is just such a bad idea. And I didn't know how bad of an idea it was until I went through it. So all of these things that I experienced, um, the wisdom comes from the pain, you know, the wisdom comes from the bad choices. And I really think that's why younger people today should really pay attention to older guys that have lived mm -hmm. life and had those experiences. These, these 20 something year old gu gurus that are holding out to the public that they're experts of making money or love or women or whatever. They're mostly a bunch of idiots lying and they're either lying or they don't know what they're talking about. So I think a lot of guys get led astray and don't get the best information. Cause again, you know, the wisdom that I have has come from the experience with the choices that I made in business and marriage and dating and love and all that sort of stuff. And the truth of the matter is, is those three things back to back were really what unplugged me from, you know, society's comforting lies, right? Um, just do the right thing and get involved with a single mom and be the man that steps up because the other guy was a loser. Cause that's a mm -hmm. story that you hear from these moms all the time. He's a beta. He was a competent. He couldn't hold the job down. He was a loser. He didn't know how to change a light bulb, really. But he was good enough when you said, I do, when you guys got engaged and married, when you felt baby rabies and wanted to have children right, right there and then. He was good enough mm -hmm. then, but later on down the road, he's not good enough. So there's all these concepts that you learn about life and society and culture and women and business and love and all that sort of stuff that at some point, you know, you have to come to the realization and acceptance if you want to live life on your terms, if you want to live life as what I would call an unplugged alpha. Mm -hmm. And I think you've only gained that by going through those experiences. And that's why like looking at anyone like younger who hasn't gone through it is crazy. So like for me, who's 27, who's approaching those years where by baby rabies becomes a thing. And for anyone who doesn't know that as people where a woman literally gets crazy to have a child and wants to have a child. Yeah. And that, that has so much relevance to me because a lot of my friends are a little bit older. And I've heard women explicitly say, yeah, like I'm looking to have children, not looking to get married, not looking to find a partner. I'm looking to get right. find to have children. Yeah. And all I think in my head is like, Jesus fucking Christ, like as in she's any on guy a timer. will do any guy will do that's got financial resources and has sufficient looking genes for her to want to be impregnated by him. And think of how that would develop over the course of years, because yeah. like if you're, you know, you're not the same nationality, not the same location, things like this can just get so fucking messy. But why it's very relevant for me even to follow people like you is because this is not really told to us. So you made a good point about the dating and about the online business stuff. So just to push back on that, just have a bit of a, a balanced conversation. Mm. Some young guys do really well in the online space because they get mm. marketing, they get content, they they understand Tinder, they understand what's what's the fallout from Tinder from a girl who wants wants to do some Tinder shit, right? Mm. But the wisdom for you has been like the actual experience in it, which is which is more significant than anything else in some regards, you know. So that's why going into marriage, kids, you need to be listening to people like you. You don't listen to the twenty four year old. That's where, right. that's where it becomes a uh, significant in that regard. Yeah. And it's no disrespect to you. I think what you're doing is great with podcasting. I think podcasting is a good way for younger men to get out there, get messages, be heard and, and interview and share the experiences of, of people that have done things, uh, seasoned gentlemen like myself that have a little salt and pepper in their hair or their beard, um, have lived some life and can speak to certain topics that I don't think the youth fully understand. They don't understand the gravity of what you sign up for in marriage in Western countries. They don't understand um, that they're generally never going to experience true, real wealth working for somebody at a job. Uh, job, J-O-B is an acronym in my book for just over broke. And <laughs> corporations and employers essentially set up a company, which is a mechanism for profit, um, and you know, the question is, well, how much do you pay an 
employee? And this is a question that will go around in the entrepreneurship community when you meet up with entrepreneurs, organization events and dinners and stuff like that. And it's like the answer to the question is always as little as possible, right? So there are some movements out there where you see employers give more than what's necessary. They'll give three weeks vacation instead of two. They'll pay them a little bit more than the standard in the industry to try to handcuff people to the business, especially if they're good people. But generally speaking, you're not going to experience like true strong wealth if you're working for somebody else. So not, that's another big red pilling moment is there's really only like six paths to extreme wealth, which most people don't get because they're just going out there doing what they think is good enough. I mean, especially if you're a kid that's raised by a single mom, women and men play life very differently, right? Men play to win, generally speaking, strong, strong, virtuous men, right? That understand society and culture and the world will play to win. Whereas women generally play not to lose. And that's why women select careers like, you know, for example, teaching or dental hygiene, because, you know, they're nine to five jobs. They get summers off if you're a teacher. They get a great pension and uh, pay and, and package and benefits and all that sort of stuff. Um, they're not generally going out there putting a massive dent in the universe, doing something big with their life. If you take a look at the list of the richest people in the world, like the list of the Forbes billionaires, um, the vast majority of people on that list are men. And the, the ones that are women generally earn their wealth either through inheritance or through divorce. So... They're only there because some guy, you know, passed down his wealth to his uh, children or they married the right guy, you know, a rich guy like I.E. Uh, Mackenzie Bezos married Jeff Bezos. And yeah. some people argue, oh, well, she helped him build the business. Really? Really? <laughs> have you have you read his biography? Do you understand everything that this man had to do to build this business? But this yeah. is the idiocracy of the general public is like, well, he was married to her for whatever, I don't know, 20 years or whatever it happens to be. So. She must have helped him build the business. Okay, sure. If that's a story that you want to believe, cool. And she deserves half of his shit, right? The interesting thing is, is that she got half of his wealth. But when she got married after the, after that divorce to the teacher, I believe it was the science teacher for one of her children in school or something like that. Um, he, he ended up having to sign a prenup. And when she untied the knot with him, she kept everything. So she was smart enough to retain the wealth. Right. So these are all like little red pilling moments in a man's life when you start to understand the dynamics in which the world actually operates versus the dynamic in which we've been told it operates, which are two completely different things once you start to separate them and you see the code. And I can 100% resonate with that, even from a personal experience. So, you know, I had a background in software engineering, background in finance, as I mentioned, and worked at a really good company, earned a really good salary for 25, 26 year old. I'd say I probably was earning more than the vast majority of people like mm -hmm. for that age, for, for, for a salary worker, okay? And I got to that point where I was like, okay, I put an input and I do not get 2X return or 3X return or 4X return. It's an unlimited, mm -hmm. it's it's a limited cap. Correct. And I kind of got to that point whereby um, I was putting in more hours and the more hours I put in did not lead to more return. So I actually had to go and find another alternative path. And like for anyone yeah. that's listened to the podcast, they they, they actually have seen that that was, because like everything I've done has ever been documented for the last three years. Every single week has been on this podcast. And it was yeah. a it was a difficult realization, you know, and it was a realization I had to come to, like as a man to be like, I cannot gain this wealth and someone who's ambitious. I can't do it. I physically yeah. can't. And I, it was very difficult because I felt like I checked the right boxes for a certain amount of time. And then I still fucked up at the end of it because I, yeah. I was told and it's not someone else's fault. It's ultimately my fault for not seeing between the, between the grasses, but between the, between the grass. But that's a thing that I've kind of come to realize. So like my kind of question for you on that is like, what advice would you have for people who are like broke, unfit, don't have that path, who are in a young stage, 2025? 20, like where did well, they start? I think at the end of the day, you can't build a strong mind and a strong life. You can't build an iron mind if you live in a weak body. So I think that for most guys, they should, they should start by going to the gym and getting into combat sports. And sure, that's a time commitment. It's an hour a day, three, four times a week. Okay, that's going to eat into maybe some video game playing time, some vegging out on the couch, some getting stone time, you know, whatever your side hobbies happen to be that, that uh, dominate your social life. Um, so there's that component of it. It's man, it, there's, there's so much benefit that, that comes out of strengthening your body. It's so obvious when you get out of the shower and you look at yourself in the mirror and you're fit and you, and you look like nobody else, 
you basically look like a superhero. So if you can accomplish that, if you can, if you can modify your body from weak, flabby, soft, shaped like, you know, shaped like a, a pear to shape like a triangle, you know, broad shoulders, narrow waist sort of thing. If you can change your body from being unattractive to being attractive, imagine what you can do with your mind and your money and your wealth and the choices that you make in the future. So the vast majority of young men out there today aren't in good shape. Like I genuinely look better than most 20 year olds that I know, you know, when I go out there in the general public, I'm in better shape. What did you? I never give away my exact age, but I'll say I'm a seventies baby. (laughs) There's a lot of weirdos out on the internet. So I, so I tend to be relatively private about certain things. And I think giving away your exact age isn't a good idea because of the insanity of, you know, the public out there in some cases. Mm Mm-hmm. That makes sense. That makes sense. So you start, we start with the, with the fitness and with the health. And I think a lot of people as well, you know, there's, it's so easy to take the easy option out, order the food, McDonald's, it's all easily accessible to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did you maintain that? Because I see a tread right between your fitness, which are super healthy, your business, which are super consistent and your, your YouTube, right? Like YouTube is not a fucking easy game. You've been at it for many years and you're super consistent. You're super yeah. focused, super consistent. What is a tread there beneath between all of your all of your um, activities? Yeah, consistency is key. You know, getting up every day and doing stuff that you don't want to do. I don't like I don't want to go boxing training. You know, there's there's days where I get up and it's like I don't want to go and and box. I don't want to hit the speed bank. I don't want to go through the drills. But I do it because it's difficult. And I do it because it keeps me competent. It keeps me strong. Nobody wants to get up and do a lot of the things that we have to do to be successful, to be strong, to be virtuous, to be rich. You know, everybody wants everything easy. They just want to put out their hand and say, put money in it. This is how the vast majority of the population works is give me free shit, right? Mm -hmm. So it's never been easier. And this is the good news. It's never been easier than any other time in history to stand out from the crowd right? Mm -hmm. Most people are turkeys. They're gobble, 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 you know, walking around (laughs) like a bunch of idiots, you know, sleepwalking through life. There's very few eagles in the sky though, right? Mm. There's a lot of turkeys on the ground, but there's very few eagles in the sky. And you can't fly like an eagle if you surround yourself with turkeys. So making clear, concise decisions in life about who you surround yourself with, who you hang out with, what you do in your spare time, events you choose to go to, um, is, is a skill that one must learn, right? Um, one of the mistakes that a lot of guys make that I've made in the past too, as well is you know, you get involved with a gal, you know, you're, you're having a good time. She's sweet. She loves you. She's intimate with you. The sex is great, all that good stuff. And then she's like, let's go hang out with my friends, you know, Claire and Billy. And, you know, we're going to have a little dinner, dinner party. And then you go there and you're sitting there and, you know, you're trying to do something with your life. You've maybe read Richard Branson's biography, you know, or something like that. You think that's interesting and you're paying attention to other business leaders and icons. And that's what you do with your spare time. And you're sitting around with a bunch of people at a dinner party who are complaining about capitalism, who are complaining that there's not enough programs in school for their kids or something like that. Uh, You know, the women browbeat their husbands or their boyfriends and they let it happen. And, you know, you have to make decisive, you have to be decisive, you know, when it comes to who you spend your time with. And it's, you know, if you come to this realization that you're sitting in a room and at a dinner party with people that are generally like generally speaking, not your tribe, like not your people, then that's okay. That is their chosen path in life. I'm not here to change them, you know, or choose their path. But the next time a gal, you know, says to me, well, let's go and do this dinner party again with Claire and Billy and Bob and all these people. I'll just say, no, thank you. And I'll tell her why, you know, I don't Mm want to, you know, surround myself with people that disparage their husbands or their boyfriends or browbeat them and treat them like shit. And it's like, do you realize all this person does is sit at home eat bonbons, get fat, and then waits for their husband to come home to treat him like shit. Like, is that a good model? Like, like these are your friends? And there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying those things and doing those things. I think having firm boundaries and being clear about the direction and path you want to go in your life is good. Some people won't like that. Some women will shame you for that. Oh, you have to be more inclusive. You have to be more embracing of, of no, I don't. I don't. And anybody that's successful, that's done anything in their life of any significance, put even a little dent in the universe, doesn't do that. Right. Mm -hmm. So as a guy, you have to, you have to be decisive in life. You have to choose to win. You have to choose to surround yourself with winners. Like every day that you get up, you make choices 
And each one of those choices compound on top of the other choices, which deliver you certain results. I can always tell what somebody's choices look like in their day by looking at their results. And I know what their choices are, and, and, it, and it leads me to their belief system afterwards. And most people have a broken belief system because they make shit choices in life. Mm, man, I fucking love that. And again, it comes down to the outcomes, like what outcome you're delivering, whether it's a business perspective, whether it's your health, whether it's your fitness, like how you're looking about it. Your quote there, but the, the network is so, so powerful because I guess I did it the long way by building a podcast to kind of mm. build my network. And I don't pretend like I'm fucking friends with guests. I never pretend that, but you know, I've been able to network with people as a result. However, um, how do you identify like the right people to be in that tribe? Because like you probably get 1500 messages a day. I get quite a few messages a day and it's like, mm -hmm. okay, how do I allocate time effectively towards something and not fucking waste my time going for coffees all the time? Well, again, I think it all starts with your belief system, mm -hmm. right? And if your belief system is organized and orchestrated in such a way that it helps your decision making process, like the choices that you make align with your goals and the results you want out of life. That's where it all starts, right? You know, so for example, I get emails and DMs from people asking me to do a, a podcast, you know, with them, you know, for example, like, you know, what we're doing over here. Okay, well, you know, how big is your podcast? What's your reach? Who have you interviewed in the past before? You know, sort of thing. These are the questions that I want to know, because if I'm going to dedicate 90 minutes of my time that I could be used to writing another chapter in my next book, uh, finishing a course that I'm working on, uh, you know, developing video ideas, doing one-on-one -on -one consults with my private clients. Like if I'm going to take time away from that, then, then there has to be some payoff to it. Right. So mm -hmm. I understand that everybody starts somewhere and, you know, you have to get the ball rolling, but, um, you know, for guys at my stage of the game, I have to be very selective with my time. I'm not a young man anymore. You know, like I'm not 28, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, like, there's less life ahead of me than what there is behind me already that I've lived. So I have to be very, very selective and fastidious with who I choose to spend time with. And that's why I want to say a massive thank you for choosing time to come on my podcast. I don't, thank I don't you. take it lightly, man. Um, in terms of what you think were the main skills that really helped you the most or what did you kind of focus on? Because what I like about you is that you're not really abrasive, you know, you're very calm and collected and, and, you know, very like, I don't know, you, you approach things in a very like, gentle way in some regards you're not very like loud and obnoxious even though you get your master master class really well so how did you kind of position your skill set of like sales marketing even like how you present yourself you have to be able to control your emotions as a man you know uh, you can get emotional and loud and there's a time and place for that like i do get loud sometimes and i do sometimes in get your car emotional <laughs> but i do it in a very precise and tactical way when it's only necessary. Um, the common collective man that you see today is not the same guy that, you know, you would have talked to when I was 25 years old. When I was 25 years old, my hair was on fire riding sport bikes at a thousand miles an hour, doing stupid shit that, you know, would have has probably, you know, potentially killed other people, right? Um, I was a speed demon, demon. I've always been fast and I've always, um, you know, for example, like on the road, road rage, you know, this topic that you hear about today, Guys like me would have gotten, you know, road rage if if the guy, uh, you know, would have cut me off in his BMW when I was 22 going to my college courses, you know, for example. And I think one of the skills that you have to learn as you expose yourself to successful people, uh, network with these people, one of the things that you realize is they don't get emotional. They don't get shouty and loud all the time, right? There's a time and place for it. And controlling your emotions is an incredibly important skill that you have to learn when to deliver certain ideas at a louder volume with some enunciation, like there's different ways to handle certain things. And again, you know, that wisdom comes with time, unfortunately. So I've had to put in the time to get that. But, uh, you know, here I am today, you know, sitting before you in that condition. Um, you have to evolve, you know, is basically what I'm saying. Like as you, as you grow and you expose yourself to life and culture and different ideas, you have to learn from them, adapt and take what works for you and add it to your belief system so that you make better choices to get those results that you want. Um, people don't paint very clear pictures in their lives. Like if people that want things would actually sit down and create a vivid vision or a painted picture of the kind of life that they want. Um, business coaches do this a lot. So I had a business coach in you know the 2000s, 2006, 2008, or in around those years. 
And one of the concepts that, you know, we created for the business was a painted picture. And you paint this vision for the kind of business that you want to run, the kind of profit margins you want, the kind of awards that you want to be recognized for, the kind of staff that you have, uh, how you envision, you know, your customers seeing you, how the public sees, you know, your business. You create this very clear picture. And now that you've got this clear picture about the kind of life, the kind of business that you want to run, now every single day when it comes down to making decisions, you know what the end result looks like. You know what Z looks like. So A, B through Z can now easily be constructed because you know how to get to Z because you know what Z looks like. It's very clear, right? So if you find yourself doing things that doesn't lead to Z, then you stop doing them, right? A very simple way to sort of put it is if you launch a ballistic missile and you know what the target is, there's wind factor, there's the rotational you know, forces of the earth, there's gravity, there's all these things that play on the direction that a ballistic missile will travel. But a ballistic missile is going to be programmed to hit a certain target. Wind moves it, gravity pulls it, rotation of the earth you know, does something to change its trajectory. It's constantly making adjustments. As a man, you have to constantly make adjustments in your life. You have to learn right? And then adjust, learn, adjust, learn, adjust. And I don't think enough guys take that seriously. You know, they're way too busy wrapped up in their head. Guys get wrapped up in their head about the dumbest shit ever. Like, oh, um, you know, my girl is talking to this guy. She has a guy friend and I don't know what to do. And I don't want to seem controlling or I don't want to, you know, try to enforce boundaries because that would seem like strange or weak or something like that. And it's like, no, no, absolutely not. Why are you wasting energy worried about that shit? When all you need to do is set a boundary and say, I don't date women that hang out with their exes. Mm -hmm. That's it. She wants to hang out with her exes. See you. Bye. I'll replace you. You know, if you're going to be that kind of gal, if that's who you are, that's fine. That's cool. Not a problem. I don't waste energy on things that are unnecessary, but guys consume themselves with it and they'll stalk them and they'll look on social media and they'll see who, you know, who likes the, the posts and the comments and they'll click through and see what guys are like women do this a lot too. This is a very feminine type of behavior, yeah. but I see yeah. a lot of guys doing this now too, because you know, they don't know how to handle women. They don't know how to in, like have frame when it comes to a long-term relationship with women. They're very bad at this sort of stuff. So they get wrapped up in the wrong shit. And it's like, dude, no wonder you're poor and fat. You've been spending all your time being betatized by this chick who's who you're completely in her frame. She doesn't respect you. She doesn't admire you. She doesn't look up to you. No wonder you're having difficulties in life. That focus that you've had or being able to like stay calm is the reason why you've been so consistent in everything because you don't lean into like shiny penny syndrome. Like fair enough, you might identify the next opportunity, but you don't like fuck off and do something completely random, which... I see time and time again, and I'm not like shitting on young guys. It's just the fact that like that's called niche hopping and you probably might see it on Twitter. People mm -hmm. swap from this to this, to this, to this, to this. Like for me, I spent three years podcasting. My business yeah. around it, everything is just, just one thing, right? I don't yeah. give a shit. And I don't want all this, other, other, all this other stuff. And funny you say this now because one of uh, this kind of startup that I'm an advisor on, or I was speaking to him last week, and we we're talking about everything, all focus, right? Focus, focus, focus. And he was like, yeah, but I have this other opportunity that I'm thinking about doing, thinking about starting. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is the reason why you, you know, you chase two hairs, you catch none or whatever the fucking expression right. is. You need to have that singularity focus. Yeah. And I, I've learned that the hard way, right? And I'm not saying this from a, you know, up here perspective. I was working nine to five. I was trading. I was doing a coaching thing. It was all bollocks, all waste of time. But when I brought it into one central team, that's when my life started to improve. Mm. And that's where I want, that's where I see the next part. But it's meant to be boring though, right? I don't know, I'd like to get your thoughts on this. Is that like when you're building something, it's meant to just be, you have the goal, routine, overnight and success, you follow like it. Like every single overnight success, everybody that's been labeled as an overnight success, didn't sleep at night, sweated, you know, bled, there was tears, there was heartbreak, there was betrayal. All of that stuff along the way is all dismissed and ignored and invisible. Because all they see is Lambo, private jets, beaches, Dubai, girls, bottle service. That's what they see. And they don't realize that everything that led up to that is usually a decade of sacrifice and hard work. But yeah. most people aren't willing to do that. They're not willing to do the boring hard work. They're not willing to do that work because it's not sexy. You, you, know, you can't post a lot of that on social media and, and get acknowledgement or get validation for it. It's, it's, it's all this, all these invisible choices that you make every single day, 
that lead to the results that they got, which look like an overnight success. Overnight successes don't exist. Every single overnight success is at least a decade of work usually. Yeah. And what uh, Hormozzi says on this is that this is what hard feels like when it's meant to be, when it's really shit, really bad, that's when you push through. And I've, I've experienced yeah. that firsthand, you know, it's just, it just keep on going. And of course it might not work out, but I always think about it, right? If it doesn't work out, well, it was never going to work out in your fucking job anyway, technically. <laughs> the truth <laughs> of the matter is, <laughs> is if you want something bad enough, you'll find a way to make it happen or you'll yeah. find an excuse. And 100%. most people find excuses. I want to ask you about the dating side of things. So you mentioned that, you know, you get the wisdom from being slightly older. Dating has definitely changed for a younger generation to, to some degree in terms of the method. So obviously like Tinder fucking blew up and now we have this new period of OnlyFans and especially where I am based in Asia, like lots of OnlyFans models everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. Like that is, to me, that severely impacted a male's perception of what a partner should be. Or what a partner could be so when you find a partner it's like well this promiscuous girl over here could have equally been my partner i want to get your thoughts on like what you think the impact of like only fans will be on males perceptions only fans is a recent phenomenon you know it's funny you mentioned online dating and and tinder and the phenomenon of of meeting the opposite sex online mm -hmm. isn't new um i met my ex-wife on a dating site called lava life and there was dating sites that were even bigger than that around the time. Plenty of fish, lemon tonic, I think. Um, you know, there's a lot of these dating sites in the early 2000s that just came out because the Internet came out. It's like, you know, sex sells. So obviously, you know, dating and introduction online seemed to seemed to be like where it started to pick up. It wasn't until we had apps on uh, mobile devices where you just swipe left and right, like Tinder and Bumble, that made things so much easier. Um, cause we like easy, we like instant gratification. We like a, you know, a quick and easy match and an opportunity to open on that very quickly. So to the point of only fans, again, you know, this is a recent, a more newer phenomenon that exists and a lot of women use it today. Uh, what is only fans? Is it prostitution? Not really because they're generally not having sex with these guys. And let's be honest. These guys that are throwing money at women to subscribe to their OnlyFans to get pictures of their butthole or whatever they're getting, um, they're not they're not society's best, right? They're not the kind of guys that these gals want to be with. They're just simps. And mm -hmm. all they're doing is they're throwing money at these girls and they're collecting it. And, and these guys are doing it under the hopes or the guys that maybe one day they can meet them or you know something will happen. Um, so it's a loser's game from that perspective. Now, if I'm a guy dating and I meet a gal and I find out that she has an OnlyFans. Okay, so here's where the frame part of it you know, comes into play. If I'm going to consider a gal in my life, and let's say it's a long-term relationship, an LTR, I'm going to want to make sure she's in my frame. I'm going to make sure that she's not doing anything to compromise the relationship. I want to make sure she's not doing anything to embarrass me. I'm Rich Cooper. I wrote the Unplugged Alpha. Imagine if society found out that my girlfriend had an OnlyFans. Could you imagine? That would be <laughs> absurd. That would be ridiculous, you know, that I would allow something like that, right? So, I mean, if she has an OnlyFans and she likes it, and I'm a single guy, let's say, um, and I think she's fun or maybe she becomes a friends with Ben, I just wouldn't take her seriously. She's just a girl selling pictures of her butthole online. Promiscuity is rampant out there. And women are indulging and men are indulging. And I don't think that's going to change. It seems like that seems to be ramping up. So the angle that I, that I would personally take is date, spin plates, which all that means is just date multiple women simultaneously, non-monogamously. And then if I'm open to a long-term relationship, which I think most guys are, then you're essentially going to let the cream rise to the top wait for her to come to you and say, where do we stand, Rich? I dig your vibe. I don't want to share you. I want to claim you, you know, like the standard sort of stuff. And then that's when you can take a look at their life and say, well, I like you too. And I've been having a good time, but I'm not going to take a gal seriously that goes out to lunch, you know, every two weeks with her ex-boyfriend. I'm not going to take a gal seriously that runs an OnlyFans. I'm not going to take a gal seriously that has, you know, 20,000 followers on her public Instagram and she's continuously posting pictures of herself in a bikini or low cut cleavage or exposing a lot of uh, skin. I'm not interested in that. Right. So, I mean, 
where are you at with this? Like, is this something that you're taking seriously? Like, is this your life choice? Is this your career to be an OnlyFans model, to be an Instagram influencer, right? Like, is this a real job? Do you make money at it? You know, sort of thing. These are some of the questions that I would have to ask, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, when you're dating out there and you're dealing with these women, I just, I mean, generally speaking, I don't think that I could look at a woman that's that's posted pictures of herself naked online, whether they're paid for or not, doesn't matter to me. It's disgusting. And women are valued based on their beauty and their purity. Um, a woman that shared her body with 100 men is less valuable than a woman that shared her body with one man for 12 years because she was in a long-term relationship. You see what I'm saying? So you have to evaluate these things when you're dealing with women in your life and be, again, fastidious about it and you know decisive about the kind of women that you're going to deal with. And if you want to have those options, if you want to have the option to say no to women, which most guys don't, First girl yeah. that touches his, his uh, pee pee, you know, he gets all excited and wants to marry her, you know, yeah, for the yeah. most part. But when you have options, when you're a high value guy, when you're doing something else with your life more than just chasing tail, you chase excellence, then you have the opportunity to say, no, thank you. And you, you know, and then you just let her go. And then you pick better women. And then you choose women that are choosing you, right? For men that are in that, let's say, top 40% bracket, 50 to 40% bracket, who don't have that much choice, but also like are not that fat. Like, how do they approach that? Because they may feel like they don't have the confidence to be like, oh, I'm gonna have multiple partners, or oh, I'm gonna say no. Because like if some girl who's semi Yeah, historically, looking, like an average guy can't have multiple women. Yeah. You know, they never have in the past. Uh if you look at men in the past that have run harems of women, like Ishmael the Bloodthirsty is one that I go back to. He was a Moroccan mm -hmm. consultant. And I think the Guinness Book of World Records has him on a known record for having the most children. They don't know the exact number, but it's, apparently it's over a thousand. Uh, he had multiple wives. He had multiple concubines. Um, he would have eunuchs. He would he would hire eunuchs. He would make men eunuchs to to guard his harem of uh, women, um, and they were all exclusive with him. And he would just pound out babies like that was his thing. Um, if you're going to run multiple women, I mean, if you're going to run a harem, if you're going to be polygynous, you know, for example. You, you have to have something going on in your life. Like you have to be a high value guy. Women will only share a high value alpha. In fact, women are more apt to share a high value alpha than be straddled with a faithful loser. It's why women would rather date a rich, successful doctor that's married than a broke loser that lives in his mom's basement with a neck beard, smoking dubs all day, playing video games for a career. They'd rather be with the guy that's done something else with his life because he also has pre-selection too because he's got a wife right? This is how women operate. And this is a uncomfortable truth that bugs a lot of people. You know, when I say these things, there's people watching this or hearing this right now that are, that are getting very upset, like visibly upset. They don't like it. They want to tune out, but you know what? You can be upset about it. It doesn't make it untrue. It's factual. Mm. Why do you think women chase men with status? Because status is really important to women, right? I mean, if you go back through history, and, you know, you set aside all the modern tropes and lies and, you know, stories that we've heard about prince, princess, one man, one woman, you know, sort of thing. Women in the past have almost always shared men, right? Um, we are essentially nomadic hunter gatherers and we've lived that way for a very long time. It's, I, I think it's only in the last 6,000 years in modern history where we've indulged in things like, uh, you know, cities, communities, uh, markets, um, trade, uh, stores of value, you know, were considered for millions of years prior to that, we were nomadic hunter gatherers and we lived in small tribes that sort of moved around and the men would go out and hunt and the women would sort of, you know, gather whatever was around the village and take care of the, the children. And that's the way things have always operated. And women would be shared amongst the highest value men within that tribe. I mean, like even today, if you go to the Amazon, you know, you go to the Amazon base deep within, you know, the woods mm -hmm. and the uh, forest, um, these tribes that have had no exposure to modern culture, helicopters, skyscrapers, you know, things like that, mm -hmm. things that are completely foreign to them. That's how they still operate today, right? You know, there's still modern version of ancient hunter gatherers where women generally share the highest value alphas in the tribe. It's not always that way, but that seems to be the common way in like. Monogamy is very uncommon in the in the uh, animal kingdom. It's 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 very very uncommon. Um, it's only become common in humans over the last you know several thousand years, 
um, because it's beca- it's become enforced. Then you've got religion. Then you've got marriage. All yeah. of these things, uh, you know, that sort of modify and play on us differently. But we are we are both polygynists and we are both somewhat monogamish. I wouldn't say monogamy um, exists, you know, within humans because true monogamy as it exists in the animal kingdom. Like if you look at birds, for example, that are monogamous, if one of the birds dies, that's it. There's no other bird after that. You know, they just live as a widow, you know, sort of thing. Like that's the way that monogamy operates in the wild. But in humans, we like to claim monogamy, but we're more monogamish because we, because it's one person at a time, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, women that will date a bunch of guys or be in relationships, you know, with a bunch of guys. It's always funny because, you know, you know, if a gal's been with 20 guys, let's say, let's use an easy light number like that. And then she meets a guy and then he says to her, okay, you know, I dig your vibe sort of thing, whatever. And she wants to claim to be monogamous, right? You know, she wants to be exclusive with him. Well, she's already shared her body with 20 other guys. How is, how is she monogamous? Right. And That's not monogamy. How that kind of happens is the fact that when they partner up with someone, that woman would often weaken them down into that position. And, and I know you read about that too, in terms of like turning a semi-alpha dude into a beta male as a result. Why is that conditioning happening? Because I have several examples of people that I've seen that happen to. But how does that happen? Uh, can, how does that happen over time, I guess? Yeah, the process is called betatization through a thousand concessions is the way that I would define it. <laughs> and that's just a guy agreeing to... Uh, subsequent concessions over a long period of time and it starts Mm -hmm. with something light you know like when she says hey let's move in together and he lives his life a certain way and she's like well i don't like that the socks are in that one basket let's have a dark hamper for dark clothes and a white hamper for light clothes so if you could please organize you know your socks and not leave them on the floor and put them in the hamper and then this is when a guy slowly Mm -hmm. starts to make some slow changes to his life to accommodate her and Women generally look at that and go, well, that's not wrong, Rich. Like, that just makes sense. That's just a better way to organize stuff, right? You're right. It, it probably is a better way to organize things. But if he's lived that way and he's 30 years old and he's been living that way for the last 10 years, that's one concession that he's made. Then it goes to the next concession and the next, and, the, and they pile up. And it, and it goes from her looking at this guy as a strong, virtuous man that she once looked up to, that she admired, that she had enthusiastic, orgasmic sex with, with, to this guy five years down the road through five years of concessions, small concessions that added up over time. He's basically now her little bitch. You know, she like she ends up pussifying the man. And it's not like she does this intentionally. Like women don't get up in the morning and say, right. I have to get up and pussify this motherfucker, you know, sort of thing. Like this isn't how women operate, but it's them trying to make sure everything is orderly within the nest, right? Mm -hmm. And it's incumbent upon men to set boundaries and be firm with those boundaries and not, you know, yield to all these little tests and concessions that are being required of them. Um, I'll give you an example. I, you know, I take a lot of supplements. I have a supplement line, obviously, you know, if you guys mm-hmm. have followed my channel and I just keep my pill bottles out on my counter in my kitchen and my girlfriend hates it. She's like, you know, why can't we put them away? Why can't we put them in a tray? Can we put them in a let lazy Susan? I'm like, no, that's, that's where they are. It's convenient for me. They're not moving. I have them out. So I know that I have to take them and I can easily see which ones I have to take. And that's it. End of story. Right. But the vast majority of men will be like, okay. You know, (laughs) what do you want to do? You want to put in a lazy Susan, whatever you want, babe. Right. And it's like, okay, like that's not going to dry her up. She's not going to hate you because of that. But if you do that 50 times, a hundred times, 300 times with small concessions here and there, all of a sudden she's going to get up one day and look at you and be like, this guy's a bitch. Yeah. And the guy's going to take less risk overall. So I think on a micro scale, softer. Exactly. So on a micro scale that works really well. But for me, this dials into so much different aspects. So we went back to the physical, the the mental, or like, let's say the, the pursuit of something. So, and then when we get older, it's usually like a business that's in pursuit of. It feels like that when I look at people who are older than me, they've closed themselves into this perspective so that they don't take the risk, don't ever want to go and pursue something. They fall out of their health and fitness. They blame it on actually having a child. You might have some, mm. you know, people like, oh, I'm having a kid. I can't, I can't 
go to the gym anymore. And then they well, one of the interesting us. things that happens to men when they have a family, when they have children, is their testosterone levels drop. Because it's just more of a female like environment. It's well, you know, there's there's experts that suggest that it happens so that men don't run off and that they stay with the child to raise and protect the child. Because men are more apt to have more promiscuous sex with a bunch of women if they have super high testosterone, right? So one of the things that happens, you know, when the children come along is his testosterone levels drop, which is why he gets less mm -hmm. aggressive. Uh, you know, he may chase less excellence. He may be less interested in going to the gym or maintaining combat sports. That's when he starts to put, like, there's the dad bod. There's no 20-year-old bod. There's no teen bod. There's only dad bods right? hundred so, percent. So it's one of those interesting things that, that happens from an evolutionary, you know, perspective. And, you know, I would even argue part of the reasons why a man's testosterone level drops when he gets in a long-term relationship and has a family and gets married and all that too, is because he goes through that betatization through a thousand concessions. You can't be a strong, virtuous man that, that runs a, uh, a family, you know, his, you know, his, uh, you know, his life and, and he leads it if he's constantly saying yes, 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 to every little thing that she wants him to do. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. I, I, it's like, you know, like kind of penny drops in that effect because it's like, it's almost like an excuse. You do it and it's an excuse. Now yeah. he's fat, lazy, low tests, and just very easy to fall over as a result and not necessarily uh, still have that pursuit of things. And I don't know, it's something to be very mindful of as I'm getting a little bit older, but it's funny because as I've, I, as I've, as I've gotten older, my test has actually increased. Would you believe mm -hmm. I was, I had a podcast recently where I actually went through it with, with a guy because I don't drink alcohol. I have a very strict diet. I have a coach. I'm in the sun. You know, I'm always out. My, my health is, my life is more driven towards health than it ended the business. than mm -hmm. it is towards, slowing down because i think you know similar enough personality type is that my biggest fear i don't know how you feel about this is that of, of slowing down i i don't want to be someone who slows down whether physically mm -hmm. or mentally um because there's isn't that just a shame that you don't live up to the potential you can go and do there's only two states in life i believe and it's growing or dying you can't stand still so you have to lean into growth 100 percent I want to ask you about the 20 red flags. We mentioned the babies, rabies, or yeah. rabies, babies. What's the most significant for you? Well, I think all of them are very significant. There's there's some deal breakers in there that are they're absolute deal breakers. Like there's certain red flags where I think women can, um, you know, they can work on things. Like, for example, if they have an addictive personality, like let's say they might have an addiction to shopping, you know, for example. Um, like I dated a gal once that used to love going to... Um, uh, department stores and it wouldn't be uncommon for her to go and buy like five lamps, bring them all home, try them out on her nightstand to see how they looked and then go back and return four of them. And it's like, that's exhausting. And that was not like a monthly or, or an annual occurrence. It was literally like a weekly, in some case daily occurrence. And that's an addictive personality. And if you bring it to their attention and just say, look, I just don't take women seriously that behave like this. Like this is a huge waste of time. And I certainly wouldn't want to get married to anybody that has an addictive personality. You need to fix that. And she's willing to work on it. Then that's cool, right? Like that's a red flag that can potentially turn into a green flag. But I think there's some red flags that are like absolute deal breakers, like uh, having a horrible relationship with her father and having daddy issues, being a feminist. Violence is an absolute no-go zone. Like some guys are like, oh, well, you know, I can just be friends with benefits with her. No, no, not even dude. Like if, you know, if she throws hissy fits and she gets mad and she whips things at you, I've talked to guys that have had knives thrown at them, you know, from their kitchen, utensils, <laughs> jars, you know, things like this. So violent women are an absolute no-go zone, right? Like that's not like, let's, let's sit her down and go to counseling and see if we can deal, you know, deal with her violence. No, I don't care. There's other women out there that aren't violent. Uh, party girls, you know, for example, women that love partying every weekend, getting drunk and stoned like three, four, you know, nights a week, mm -hmm. women with a large notch count. You can't reverse that. You know, if she shared her body with 200 men, there's no like she can't get right with God. And all of a sudden, you know, we're just going to forgive the 200 guys that she banged. No, like like there's certain red flags that you can't change. Right. Yeah. And I think what's funny there is the fact that it's completely different to perception right now for male and female for that. And I'll give you a good example. I have like lived in Asia for many years. I was living in a villa that the villas are kind of open plan. Like you might have a kitchen outside or a pool outside. And every night there was a woman who would like smash glasses 
she'd come home or else just be at home, be on the phone to someone on FaceTime, some guy, and just would fucking rage. Mm-hmm. And me and my girlfriend would literally hear her regularly smash glasses and the cleaners have to go in in the morning, Indonesian cleaners, and clean up the glass and stuff. Mm-hmm. If that was a man, someone would call the police, 100%. Exactly. Yeah. And I just thought, and this wasn't one day. This was two years. Was and, she with a, a guy or was she just by herself? Uh, a combination. It would be either on FaceTime or you know, okay. FaceTime talking to someone or else like a guy would come in. But I never really saw a guy, but I just, I may have heard someone. Could you imagine that, being but... the man that would tolerate that, that would, that, that would tolerate a violent woman that would be smashing glasses? Like you'd have to be some kind of a loser to, to be like, this is the best that I can do. Like this is the absolute best I can do. A woman with a bad temper that throws hissy fits and breaks glasses. And what's most alarming, I think, is the fact that if you saw her on on the street or whatever, you wouldn't assume it or you wouldn't see it or she may not pass it across. So that's like a behavioral trait that's like, if that was in a dude, you'd be like, okay, like he's dangerous. That is dangerous, you know? Um, Well, I mean, the interesting thing is women actually like dangerous men. Women love dangerous men that know how to control it. So let me be clear on that. Like women love, like if you're a... uh, combat sports guy right like if you're into mma or something like that and you're in combat sports you're clearly a dangerous man but if you can control it around you know the people that you love you know your family your wife your children like conor mcgregor he's married with kids right um if you watch his documentary on netflix you can see he clearly loves his family he loves his wife and he loves his children but he can beat the living shit out of somebody in a cage right like women like a dangerous man but he has to be able to control it so Dangerous men are attractive to women, but dangerous women should not be attractive to men. That's a man with low options. And the the ultimate test of that is in the in the first McGregor documentary, or I think it was only the, only the one, was when his wife D was with him during his like um, uprise, like his rising, and mm-hmm. they were in that shitty council estate in Dublin, mm-hmm. and she was with him the entire time, and he was spending sixteen hours a day in the gym. And she yeah. could see that this this dude was very nice to her, very like compassionate at times. And he was super ambitious. He had a goal, he was driven, super fucking focused. Mm-hmm. And she's behind she's behind the mission then, you know. 100%. That, yeah. that, that's what it's all about. She they don't want to And that's a good mis- woman. Like that's the kind of woman that you want. You want a woman that's on your purpose, that's going to support your mission and is a compliment to your life. That's a good uh segue into into money as well, which I want to ask you on. Is that have you have you seen your like um, I guess like attitude change as you begin to earn a lot of money or your perspective change in, in life? The thing that money changes for, for people is it creates more options in your life, right? Like it gives you the ability to do things. Like you want to get to the point as a guy where you have F you money, right? Where you can just say no because you don't need it because you've got money. You know, like you can say no to anything that might potentially be compromising of your values it might be dangerous there's any number of things you know to look at so there's the option aspect of it clearly the other thing that i've noticed money does is it amplifies who somebody is so they say this about alcohol too like if somebody's just an idiot and they get drunk they just become a giant idiot right um i think i think with money it it amplifies the personality type of that individual um so, uh, you know, generally speaking, one of the things that I've learned is that the guys that grew up without a lot of money or didn't do very well with women, you know, for example, if they accumulate a lot of wealth and they start doing better with women, what they start to do is they start to brag about it. You'll see them online. They'll post lots of pictures of their cars, you know, the women, they'll brag about having multiple women publicly, you know, sort of thing. Um, so so it's an amplifier for for a lot of people that didn't have much to begin with as well too so that's another thing that you'll notice with money it's more of like um it pulls out the insecurities in some way because those insecurities are still there if it was absent when you were younger yeah but i mean like old money like there's lots of people out there that are absolutely loaded billionaires that are in their 20s and you don't even know about them right because they don't showcase anything on on social media because they've always had money it's you know it's not new to them they don't have to brag about it so um i mentioned you know, i lived in singapore and the, the difference between singapore and dubai is actually fascinating so dubai is new money and singapore is old money so a lot of my like network i guess in singapore are 55 year old guys who had businesses they their businesses were like warehouses across asia like they manufactured warehouses and gave them to 
grains and people are fucking selling barley or whatever, creating barley through it. And you would not think that they have a hundred dollars in their bank account. Mm. They're super relaxed. They don't they don't have cars or anything because get public transport. Now, of course, there's a way to like live your life as well at the same time, but they have an element of humility and respect and dignity that you just don't see with new money. You just mm-hmm. don't, you just don't see it. And I think it's so fascinating to, to observe. A lot of them are kind of like old Chinese kind of money. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a way that I kind of, I guess, want to live my life. I, I'm not saying that I have money in any regard, but it's, it's a, it's a great way to live in some regard because they're very helpful for someone. They'll view you as a student and want to see you succeed. But at mm. the same time, they do not sho- shove it in your fucking face. Yeah, that's what I've seen. It's cool. Um, how does re- how does money impact relationships, especially marriage? How does money impact relationships? Well, let's be honest. I mean, women like money. Um, money is useful. It, you know, it pays for things. It can buy a nicer house. It can buy security. It can buy transportation. It can buy health care. Um, money solves a lot of problems. So there's a reason why women are attracted to successful men. Um, women in their nature are hypergamous. And all that means is they date above their own socioeconomic level. So it's why you'll see, you know, Kevin, the vice president of accounting at the large firm, marrying uh, Becky, who's the hairdresser making $40,000 a year. Uh, it's very common. You know, you'll see that all the time. I did private mortgages for years. And one of the things I always had to look at with private mortgages is um, the application. And you'll see him and her on the application with a credit report and what their source of income is and the proof of income and all that. And I'd say 95% of the time, Mr. Made way more money than Mrs. Right? Like that's, that's just how women operate. So do women like money? Yes. Are women gold diggers? You know, you can call them that, but I don't think that they are gold diggers in, in the sense where it's nefarious. It's just yeah. women want security, right? Like they want to know that they're with a guy that can look after them. Um, now, women's mating strategies differ depending on their age, where they are in their ovulatory cycle in that month. It's why you'll see, uh, you know, 20 year old women party in their 20s and drink and get uh, get stoned and party till like four or five o'clock in the morning and smoke and bang a bunch of alpha males. Um, they're not looking for provision and they're not looking for their money. If he's a hot dude and you know, it's the right place and time and it's the right night and, and, and he's cute, she'll bang him, right? Like it, it's not uncommon at, at all. But that same woman, when she's 35 years old and she's been single and hasn't found a guy and wants to get right and have a family, um, that she's not always looking for the alpha male. In fact, she'd like to have it, but she probably can't find the alpha male with the guy that's got the money as well, that's willing to settle down with her. So she often finds what's called beta bucks, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, which is a more beta male. He's more agreeable. She's somebody that, um, you know, she can run easily. Uh, but he's got financial resources. He's a doctor, he's a lawyer, he's an accountant, he makes good money. He can pay for the house. He can buy her the Range Rover that she wants, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, so money has importance, but again, like women's interest in men shifts depending on their age, depending on where they are in their ovulatory cycle. Like when women cheat on their husbands or their boyfriends, they're usually doing it when they're ovulating. They're not doing it when they're, um, menstruating. Right. And it's because when women ovulate and you know, this is factual, Marty, Marty Hazleton wrote a book on this stuff, um, is they're looking for the guys that have the strong, like high testosterone cues, chiseled jaw, broad shoulders, narrow waist, good looks. They want the seed, right? They want the alpha seed. They want the uh, good genes from that guy. And ideally, they'd like that guy to also, you know, provide and take care of the kid, but they're okay if, you know, he doesn't. And that's when they go looking for beta bucks. That's why you see these women on dating apps now. And a lot of them, I mean, not a lot of them, but (laughs) there's a good chunk of them that I've seen now. People send me these screenshots routinely now where they're pregnant and they're on a dating app saying, I'm 24 years old. I'm a stay at home mom. I already have a kid. I don't have time to mess around and I'm six months pregnant. And if you're not man enough for that, then swipe left. Right. (laughs) It's not like I've seen it once, my friend. I've seen it a lot. And that's like a guy. Could you imagine a guy in a dating app? Like what's a low value guy? You know, a low value guy to women would be, I like to sit around and play video games all day. I'm fat. I'm on welfare and I live in my mom's basement. Now, guys can't get away with saying that because women would never choose them. But there's so many desperate guys out there that would be happy to cuck themselves 
raise another man's seed, even one that's in her belly when he gets with her to take care of things. That's disgusting, right? But guys will, they'll, they'll sign up for that, man. But strong guys that have their shit together, they just look at that and they go gross and they just move on. Why I guess why that's so like impactful is the fact that a lot of those guys did not capitalize on the time that they had in their twenties to work on the business, work on their mind, yeah. work on work on anything. So they get to a position whereby they're fucked and then they have no other choice but to do this path, which is fucking horrific to begin with. So yeah. it's like taking that responsibility. And of course, like I think it's so much easier to lean into those easy pleasures of going out, getting fucked up, drink, drugs, whatever it is. Leaning into that is like ten times more is more e- is e- ten times easier than going off and doing something difficult, you know. And yeah. I know you've taken a break from alcohol, or you might just have a few bellies or whatever here or there. Um, how has that experience been for you, reducing your alcohol? Well, alcohol shit. I mean, there's nothing really great that comes out of consuming alcohol. There's no there's no health benefits to it. Um, yeah. Some people argue, well, a glass of wine is good for you. Well, you can have resveratrol in a capsule. You don't have to drink wine to get that, right? So the benefits that come with red wine, you can get in a capsule and not have to deal with the alcohol or the upset stomach or any of that, uh, you know, other gastrointestinal issues that a lot of guys get. Um, So I don't see any benefit to consuming alcohol. Do I drink it from time to time? Rarely. But, you know, it's like, you know, the last time I had a drink, I was out on a rally. It was a spring rally with some friends and we were in New York and we were having dinner at this Italian restaurant. And we're like, you know, the waiter's like, you know, well, what do you want to drink? And people start ordering drinks. I thought to myself, you know, I haven't had a good old fashioned in a while. So I order myself an old fashioned. That's that's the odd time that I'll have a drink. Right. But I don't see any benefit to drinking booze on a regular basis. It does more harm than it does good. It doesn't improve your life. Mm-hmm. So I've haven't drank for a year it's been just over a year now and uh the reason why is because like basically like i'm not that smart not that intelligent if i'm going to build something that's anyway substantial i need to like commit to it and really commit and get rid of the low-hanging fruit which is going out Mm -hmm. getting fucked up all the time right but i said this to justin and the the video kind of went viral for good and bad reasons some people were like super insecure being like what the fuck he should be drinking whatever whatever other people were like I really struggle with this. I'm young, I'm male, my friends are pulling me to the pub, my friends are pulling me to the bar, I don't know what to do. I think I got probably close to 100 DMs from people saying, I'm really struggling. I find this really fucking hard. And a lot of them are Irish, a lot of them are from the UK. Mm. And I really sympathize with it because like, I was not that part. I had a great time. I'm not going to say I didn't. I was in Ibiza, I was awake for four days straight, right? Like there's nothing, like that's just the reality. But then I had to unwind it in my brain. And how I advise people is to set a really fucking big goal. Sign up for a fight, build something, do something, even Mm -hmm. try to do well in your exams. But I don't know, it kind of gets to me a little bit personally because I've, I've definitely been there. And I know that it's a condition in society that you should go to the bar, you should get a point, you should do this. But when you're like us, geared to where you are as a male, you take the fucking piss, especially for Irish. Tree yeah, well, in the, you know, you know, what do you want to make out of your life? Right. It's, it's, you know, it's how bad do you want it? And it's, you know, I said this earlier, you know, you'll either find a way to make it happen or you'll find an excuse. Most guys will find the excuse. Oh, well, my friends are going out for a pint. So I have to go if I want to, you know, maintain that friendship or be in that circle sort of thing. And it's like, okay, well, that's one way to approach it, but it's a way from winning. It's a way from bettering yourself. So it just boils down to self-control. It's a lot of guys have an addiction to porn today. Like there's this new thing called no fap. We didn't have no fap when I was a kid. Nobody talked about no fap. You know, people still fapped, right? It was like, you know, you'd find your uh, dad's porn collection or your friend's dad's, you know, porn collection. And, you know, you knew where to go to get it. You, you know, you'd go at it, you'd go at yourself. And that's what, that's what kids did, you know, sort of thing. Now I hear kids today that are so addicted to porn. They're like, well, what do I do? And I just have to go cold Turkey and I have to know fap. And you know, how do you stop masturbating? And it's like, why is this a problem? Right? Like it wasn't a problem when I was a kid. Now maybe it's a problem because it's more readily available. You know, you can get it on any screen, any device, anywhere for free. It's, it's very easy to access. And then you have things like only fans and these thirst traps that are selling pictures of their butthole and all that sort of stuff. So maybe it's a little bit more accessible, but it's not like I didn't have access to it when I was younger. 
Nobody had conversations about like, oh, I'm addicted to porn. People today that are addicted to this, it's because they're weak. They have a weak mind, right? We have a society that is weak minded today, which is why they yield to things like drinking and drugs and uh, porn and things like that. It's like, you know, if you can't make your vice your bitch, then you're the bitch. That's all that boils down to. So if you want to get up in the morning, call yourself a bitch. You know, if you've been drinking the night before, if you're going to go drinking that night before you go drinking, call yourself a bitch because that's what you are because you can't control yourself and you can't stop yourself from doing something. Same thing with porn. You know, if you're masturbating throughout the day, constantly ongoing, like why, why, like, why can't you find a girl? Why can't you have sex? Right? Like what's the problem? Right now? I understand that there's some guys that, uh, you know, resign to, I'm not good enough looking. I'm not tall enough. My skin's the wrong color. And they make up these reasons in their head. Again, these didn't exist when I was a young man. We just made it happen. We made it work. You know, we didn't have yeah. addictions to porn. If we wanted to have sex, we would have sex. You know, what's funny there is, uh, I know people regularly say like, oh, like not be tall enough, whatever. I'm five, seven on a good day. Put it that way. Right. And I played rugby. You might be, you might be familiar with rugby when you're living in the, in the UK. So, I had no other choice but to get fucking jacked at like 15 years old. Like I was mm -hmm. small, right? And as a result, I've always been in good shape. I, sometimes I get in great shape, sometimes I'm generally in good shape. And it never, ever, ever came into my brain saying, I can't go do something because I'm not, not tall, tall enough. enough. Yeah. I, but because the people Isn't who are six foot four, but the people who are six foot four, six foot five, have never looked at me and said, Oh, like he's too small because I'm generally bigger than him because like my physique is good, like good genetics from that perspective in terms of like symmetry and stuff. But I think that's hilarious how I just never knew it. And then only about a year ago, people would use that. People say that as a, you know, like one a of my best friends before. growing up was five foot four and he had way more women in his life than I did. I'm six foot two, right? He had yeah. way more women. Like he, he was just, he was that, he was that guy. Like he was a player, like he was the game. And mm -hmm. I mean, he had, you know, he would bang anything, you know, sometimes his standards were different, but, <laughs> um, but he did just fine. Right. And you know, these guys that they, they don't understand, like women just want to look up to you. So if you're five foot seven, a five foot two chick, even in heels is still going to look up to you because you're still taller than her. Right. Mm -hmm. But then there's these guys, they just get all, all black pilled and they're like, Oh, it's impossible. What am I going to do? Da, da, da. It's like, fine. If that's where you want to go, then go there. Right. Like I can't help you, you know, yeah. Wh whatever you believe, it doesn't matter what, whether you believe right or wrong. It's true because it's what you believe. 100%. And that's a big thing, even like we're building a business is that, you know, you have to have to believe because no one's going to fucking believe in you. That's you don't, one of man. the worst things that I've heard, heard from guys is I can't be an entrepreneur. I can't start a business because not everybody can do it. There's not enough money out there, you know, for me to do something to, to get some. And all the rich, successful people have hoarded it all. And I say bull fucking shit. That's a loser's <laughs> mindset. That is that is the biggest cop out I've ever heard. There's not enough money out there for me to make it. And not everybody can be an entrepreneur. You're right. Not everybody can be an entrepreneur. Not everybody can be worth seven or eight or nine figures. You're absolutely right. But have you fucking tried? 100%. It's right. all from the people as well that are more successful than you that are actually pretty dumb and pretty just like, you know, because Trust of the me. fact that... <laughs> I know lots of very, very wealthy people and they're no brighter than anybody else out there. They yeah, just tried 100%. harder. Rich, I want to say a massive, massive thank you. I really, really appreciate this. You're genuinely. Welcome. And um, anything I could ever do for you, really, really appreciate it. I'd love to help out in any way. But um, very helpful for young people. My audience are all 25, 30 years old. So this is perfectly you know, on target, on market. And of course, I'll have all your right book all the details and everything in down below and um you'll see the the content machine as i describe it pushing a lot of our content over the next few weeks though but man i want to say a massive thank you really appreciate it thanks man i appreciate you having me